University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. Welcome to the first show of the new school year of Have You Heard, the UC3P News Quiz. I'm announcer and scorekeeper Patrick Taylor, a first year in the college. And here's your host, Jason Zukas. Thank you. What a great crowd. <laughs> My name is Jason Zukas, a joint degree MPP MBA student at the University of Chicago, and as Patrick said, your host for this program. I'm joined today by three contestants. Sugriti Nayer, a second-year MBA student at Chicago Booth, Nancy Tan, a second-year MPP student at Chicago Harris, and Alex Jeffrey, a first-year MPP student at Chicago Harris. And to inaugurate the first show of this new school year, we'll also have the one and only Harris School Dean Catherine Baker on later to play a special quiz round. So for all of you first-year students here in the crowd, uh, in case you aren't totally sure what you're watching, let me give you a quick explanation. So I'll be asking the contestants quiz questions about real news events from the last few months, and they'll try their best to come off as confident, worldly scholars. No pressure. (laughs) So Nancy. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot to catch up on from over the summer. We'll start with a round of Complete the Quote. So I'll read out some recent quotes from the news, and you'll need to tell me who said it or who it was about. The first round of quotes will review some notable statements made by various world leaders. Are you ready? Not really, (laughs) go ahead. (laughs) Okay, which country's leader stated in May that, like the famous cat in Tom and Jerry, they will lose again? Oh my gosh. So Um, here's a hint for you, because I know that's a hard one to start off with. The previous sentence to the statement was, The U.S. has tried various political, economic, military, and propaganda undertakings to hit the Islamic Republic, but all of these plots failed. So which country was this? Ours. (laughs) (laughs) They're talking about the U.S., and they said the U.S. has tried to hit the Islamic Republic. Throw something out there. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) It was Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, Uh, using this oddly American analogy when he was criticizing the U.S. for leaving the Iran deal and reimposing harsh sanctions. Oh, yes. All right, so next we'll go to Sukriti. So do you know about the Kiki Challenge? Uh, Not only do I know (laughs) about the Kiki Challenge, but I got 18 boothies to do the Kiki Challenge in Iceland this summer. Uh, So I'm fully on board. That is amazing. Do you want to tell everybody what it is then? No. Okay, I'll do that for you. So it's where people basically get out of their car while it's moving and dance alongside it to Drake's In My Feelings. What? It's not safe. I do not recommend it. Uh, So (laughs) for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, just Google it later. So anyway, Sukriti, which world leader said at a national youth conference in his country, you are riding in cars and playing kiki. Mr. Tariq, raise the fuel prices and don't worry. So the name of his Minister of Petroleum, Mr. Tariq, should give you at least an idea of the area of the world we're talking about. I mean, I'm not trying to stereotype. (laughs) Um, Can you give me another hint? So you know the region of the world. It's not the country that we just previously had a question about. So what's your guess? Saudi Arabia. No, unfortunately it was Egypt. So President el-Sisi of Egypt uh, made this lighthearted joke uh, and it seemed to go over well with the audience. The gas prices are a sore spot for some Egyptians after the government hiked prices three times over the last two years. Oh so maybe he'll come to regret that quote. But finally, Alex. All right. You may recall that at last year's NATO summit, President Trump was caught on camera shoving Montenegrin Prime Minister Markovich aside during a photo op. <laughs> so when this person asked President Trump why he did that, Trump reportedly said, oh, he's just a whiny punk bitch. So who is it who asked Trump about this incident? Queen Clarice Rinaldi of Genoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angela Merkel? So I'll give you a hint. This episode was revealed in an excerpt from her memoir that was released in August. So who is the most recent of the <laughs> memoirs and tell-alls that have been coming out? Um, Lord. <laughs> Theresa May? <laughs> no. It's actually Omarosa. 
Uh. So she had asked Trump why he'd act so aggressively, and that was his alleged response. All right, well, uh, good work. We're off to an okay start. I think uh, it's okay. There's plenty more questions. So much news has happened. Uh, there's been a lot then. of news. There's believe been me. so much news. So much knowledge. And, <laughs> and I just want to say it's been very tempting with these quote rounds to fill them with Trump-related material because there's so much out there. But I've tried to restrain myself. But since this is our third show and it's only the second Trump-themed quote that I used, I felt like I should probably just add a little bit more. There's been so much good material over this summer, after all, uh, with all of the tell-alls and leaks that have come out. So the next quiz segment I'm going to call Trump or False. So I'll tell you an anecdote, and you have to tell me if it's a true statement about Donald Trump or false. And no, you won't earn any extra points by yelling out fake news as an answer. Okay, good to know. All right, who wants to start? Alex. Alex, okay. In her new book, Full Disclosure, Stormy Daniels compared Trump's uh, (laughs) private parts to a character from Honic the Hedgehog. True or false? True. False. That would be pretty ridiculous, right? No, it was actually that she compared it to Toad from Mario Kart. (laughs) Not much better. (laughs) Sorry, while you're eating, to bring that image to you. (laughs) All right, Nancy, (laughs) we'll have you take the next one. At the G7 meeting in June, Trump reportedly threw Starburst candies at German Chancellor Angela Merkel and said, here, don't say I never give you anything. False? No, that was true. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Merkel and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau were pressing Trump to sign a joint communique that's traditionally signed by all the leaders at the end of the G7 summit, but Trump instead resisted with his starburst outburst (laughs) and refused to go along. Okay, Sukriti. I'm ready for it. After repeatedly calling North Korean's Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un Rocket Man on social media and even at the UN, Uh, President Trump decided to deliver a CD he signed of Elton John's song, Rocket Man, to Kim, using Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as a courier. True or false? It sounds false, but I think it's just ridiculous enough to be true. So, what's your final answer? True. True. It is true. (laughs) (laughs) Though for whatever reason, Pompeo didn't actually deliver it to Kim. And also, I just want to like, point out that he wanted to deliver a CD that he signed, not that Elton John signed, that <laughs> President Trump signed. That's just another important detail. Okay, so after the break, we'll be having on Harris Dean and Catherine Baker for a special round of Not My Research Area, where we ask faculty about topics completely unrelated from the academic area of expertise. Well, we are lucky enough to have joining us today our special guest, Catherine Baker, the current dean of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Dean Baker is also the Emmett Dedman Professor at Harris and a leading scholar in economic analysis of health policy. Please give a warm welcome to Dean Baker. Uh, okay. You can hang on every word. Hi, Dean Baker. Thanks for joining Have You Heard, the UC3P News Quiz. I would say I'm happy to be here, but I'm a little scared about what I've gotten myself into. (laughs) (laughs) So, Dean Baker, first, I'd love to start by just hearing a bit about how your experience has been as the new Harris Dean. Any unexpected surprises? So this is my second year. I came last August, and I feel like I spent the whole first year being constantly baffled by everything that was going on, mostly in a good way. But now it's my second time through, so I'm supposed to know what's going on, which is a little more nerve-wracking because I can't pretend that I've never heard it before. (laughs) But I'm so happy to be here. It's an amazing school, as you all know, and this is a really big year for us with the move to the new building and how many students we have, which is really good news for policy because we need more of you going to fix that mess out there. But I realize everybody's a little crammed in right now. So there is all sorts of excitement this year. But it's all good stuff coming up. Is the move into the Keller Center still on track for winter? On time and under budget. (laughs) That's right. Uh, We are moving the you know, all of the stuff's getting packed up the week of December 17th, so classes will be done. You'll all do whatever it is you do when you're not here, which I don't need to know about. <laughs> we'll move. You'll come back in January. New digs all around. And what are you most excited for in the new building? 
there's going to be a really good cafeteria, so yeah. we're all excited about that. So much more space with the forum on the ground floor. We'll be able to have so many more events, and there are all these cool work areas for people to get together, study, of course, which is what you do when you're not here and also when you are here, I'm sure, 24-7. Then lots of team rooms and, and a lot more interaction between students and faculty and staff. So I think that we'll all see each other a bit more. Now we're all a little bit tucked away. Sounds great. And is there anything you want to share with the first year uh, new MPP students as they power through their first midterms? It gets better. <laughs> I, so I'm an economist by training, and the first year of grad school in economics at most programs is incredibly uh, technical and completely removed from anything that you might care about if you're interested in public policy. So I found it a little grueling that first year was heavy investment in the toolkit. I made a lot of really good friends. There's nothing like, you know, trial by fire to really form lifelong bonds. And then I got to move on to the classes that really captured my interest, which was always public policy. Here at Harris, I like to think that we have a bit more of a mix in the first year, but I know it is really toolkit heavy the first year, and trust me, it's worth it because you are never going to go back and learn statistics when you're out in the real world, and it's going to be useful all the time. So think of it as a really good foundation and just power through. Great. And now, talking a bit more about your work as an academic, you're perhaps best known as one of the principal investigators for the Oregon Medicaid experiment where the limited expansion of Oregon's Medicaid program through a random lottery allowed you to track those who received Medicaid coverage and those who didn't. So could you tell the audience a bit about what you found? Absolutely, and I also want to start off telling you how the study got going. Oregon had a limited number of spots for its Medicaid program, and they decided the only fair thing to do would be to allocate those spots by lottery, and that's a whole other story. My colleague on this, Amy Finkelstein, who's at MIT, read about this in the paper, and I heard a story on NPR about this lottery in Oregon, and we got together and said, like, really, was it a lottery? Like, a random lottery? Like, a randomized controlled experiment lottery? And the answer was that it was, and so we used that as a chance to figure out what Medicaid actually does, and you all at Harris are aware it's really important to figure out what a program does based on an analysis of real evidence, not just hopes and dreams, because there are lots of things that sound great and don't pan out. So we were able to gather all this evidence, and we found that Medicaid does a world of good for the people who were enrolled in it. Their mental health improves. Their financial security improves. They get more access to care. They're more likely to get preventive care. So that's the good news. The less good news, if you're in favor of expansion, is that it's really expensive because people use more health care. They go to the doctor more. They go to the hospital more. They use more prescription drugs. And they go to the emergency department more. And I think people were really surprised by that. They hoped people would leave the emergency department to go to the doctor's office, but they do both. And so that leaves policymakers with a real dilemma. You've got people who benefit from the program, and you've got people who need to pay for it, and those aren't the same people. And that's why it's really important that you learn how to analyze programs, but also how it plays out in political reality. Because we had this really nuanced picture, Medicaid does some really important things for the people who were enrolled, but it's really expensive. You have to figure out how to finance it. We tried to tell this nuanced story, and our current political discourse is not always amenable to a nuanced story. I know that's news to everyone, <laughs> but it turns out that doesn't fit in a tweet, what I just said. And so it was really challenging to try to convey to policymakers and to the popular press their real trade-offs here. It's not all winners or all losers. And so are you continuing to track health outcomes over the longer term now as, you, as we move forward with the program? We're definitely still gathering data because if there is a variable we can merge on, we are getting that variable. <laughs> but there were expansions after our study period, even in advance of the ACA or Obamacare, where now that whole population in Oregon has access to health insurance, which is great news for that population, but it means the experiment is over. But even when the experiment is over, the analysis can continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. I'm sure it'll be very helpful as we continue to have debates over Medicare for all, Medicaid for all, expansion of Medicaid or not. And so I'm sure that'll be really valuable, all the findings. 
But what we're here for today for this quiz round, though, even though you are an expert on Oregon's Medicaid program, we're going to see how well you know other facts about the Beaver State. So this will be a quiz round.